Okay, um, now I, I would like to introduce Dr. Vivian Otawang, uh, the current Deputy Director of the Office of uh, Research on Women's Health at NIH. Dr. Otawang brings a diverse background as a genetic counselor, genomicist, and psychologist with extensive experience in data science, ethics, and health policy. Amongst numerous achievements, Dr. Ota Wang has been pivotal in enhancing public health data accessibility through her roles at NIH, particularly with the creation of NIH COVID Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics Data Repository. Dr. Ota Wang has served in critical policy roles under two presidential administrations, developing ethical guidelines for emerging sciences. She has also held influential academic positions at institutions like Rutgers and Vanderbilt, focusing on research ethics and community engagement. Holding a PhD in Master of Philosophy in Counseling and Psychology from Columbia University and Master of Science in Genetic Counseling from the University of Colorado, Dr. Ota Wang is recognized as a fellow by both the American Medical Genetics and the American Psychological Association. Today, she will discuss why sex and gender matter in women's health research, exploring significant advances in women's health, the impact of recent White House initiatives, and the crucial role of collaboration in promoting health equity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vivian Ota Wong as she shares her profound insights on shaping the future of clinical care in women's health. Dr. Wong? Thank you very much. And wow, thank you for such a generous introduction. I will try to live up to it. Anyway, um, what I'm hoping to do is, um, first of all, let's go ahead and get started. Is This is just really my disclaimer that I have no um, conflicts of interest. And that um, what we're going to do for the next uh, up to an hour is, is uh, really trying to share what is women's health and the health of women? And then really examining what is the NIH Office of Research of Women's Health doing? And then focusing on the issues of sex as a biological variable. And we actually have a policy at NIH that I would like to talk about because it is very pivotal into the White House Women's Research Health Initiative that we're actively working with and collaborating with, not only across the different institutes uh, centers and offices at NIH, but also throughout the department and across the U.S. government. Then last but not least is really talking about its full implications and where you um, can actually make a difference. So when I think about women, I think about women's health. And what we do know is that women spend about 25% more time in their lives in poor health. And um, then, so really, uh, and this is really in relation to men, and this, this is really based on a couple of reports, one from the uh, World Economic Forum, and then the other one is, is for the Pathways to a Healthy Future for Women. So it really begs the question is, how come? We, what we also know is that gender also influences women how they receive care. And, and these are just some examples. It's not necessarily but the science, but the way that people interact with them. So for example, we know that women in pain, that there's a lot of disparities where women can actually express um, that they have pain and people are dying to be heard um, because they have a hard time getting the medical care for it. It's also the, uh, the instances where women are actually trying to seek medical care and they get dismissed. So why, what is the consequence of that is that women are more likely to wait longer for a health diagnosis. And, and many times it's just they're being told it's all in their head. So for me, I want to, uh, to challenge you to imagine a world in which every um, are in uh, NIH, you know that there really is an expectation that all research uh, data generated needs to be shared for secondary analysis. At the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about the White House Initiative for uh, Research on Women. So this is policy that is really undergirding a lot of the society and, and how women are experiencing um, their health. But I also want to bring um, into focus that there's a lot of biology. And the way that we're thinking about it is really systems biology in the sense that this is the, the human disease network that was originally published in, in 2015, really highlighting that even though we think of disease 
places as being very separate, they're actually very related. And this, I just put it up because I like it's a, oops, I don't know why this is going. Sorry, this may drive you crazy while well, it's, okay. So, so part of this biology is we, we really believe in whole person health. And this is just an example of which we're really trying to look at mid health um, uh, of women. It's really a combination of metabolic dysfunction, anxiety, depression, and substance use, pelvic floor disorders, issues related to cardiovascular disease, as well as bone health and osteoporosis. And, and we can never forget our brain health and dementia. So as you can see, all of a sudden, it's starting to really get complicated about how do we understand women's health. Sorry about my slides. I, the automatic timer is on. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. So what we need to do is really uh, understand this, what I would call the biopsychosocial level interactions, where we're looking at the cells, the systems, the organisms that are within it, and the culture itself. And by doing that, we have to put into the account the environment that is gendered assumptions that affect these interactions, these uh, gendered assumptions based on researchers, the researcher participants, communities, and their institutions. Because what we know is that women and men follow different paths to disease and health, even though they may be starting at the same point. So what does this look like? Let's first look at um, life expectancy. So this um, is really across the, the globe, but it really is showing in general, women outlive men in terms of years of life. And so if you look in the highlighted uh, piece for the United States, it will really illustrate that women on the, on the right live into their uh, over 80s while the men are living into their late 70s. But what does that really mean? Well, we know that women experience health and disease differently. So what the uh, bar graph shows on the left is that you can see that there's a ballooning in midlife um, of women actually starting to accumulate different types of diseases, ranging from muscular uh, skeletal disorders, as well as substance use, uh, diabetes, and mental and neurological disorders, which is very different from the men, as you can see that their prevalence of diseases is relatively little in, in terms of number and magnitude. But on the right, what this really also shows is that difference of years lived with uh, for women is that they lived those additional years with increased physical and cognitive disabilities. So having more years doesn't necessarily equate to an increased quality of life. And what we have to look here at this next uh, is that what we have to realize for mid -year, uh, midlife of women is there's a, a lot of multimorbidities. And as you can see that the women on the uh, in the on the the graph on the left really illustrates that the women are actually experiencing a lot more multimorbidities across their uh, mid to older life. And the patterns of disease, if we look on the right, is really the combinations of and magnitude is that the women are experiencing it at much greater frequency and magnitudes than men on um, than men. So the other piece I want to focus on is really issues of maternal death. And what we know that there's a really high frequency of maternal death, um, not only in the United States, but also worldwide. And what we have to pay attention to is that it's not only at, at the time of delivery, but it can go up to a year after the pregnancy. And some of these causes are hemorrhaging, cardiovascular and coronary um, conditions, infections, embolism, as well as mental health conditions. So if we think about maternal mortality rates among some of the first world countries, what you'll see on the far right is that the United States rates by race and ethnicity are magnitudes higher than a lot of the first world countries um, and then we need to ask the, the question, why? If you look at the far right, you see that the U.S. Black population has twice the magnitude of mortality rates uh, for, for, uh, maternal, uh, for maternal mortality rates. So if we break this up, if we talk about uh, race, um, that we also look at the comparisons for the last four years, that if we look for, uh, between non-Hispanic Black and non-Hispanic white uh, women, 
as well as Hispanic women, even their the uh, magnitude of the maternal rates are increasing, but it's at a higher numbers for black women. And so what we have to remember that it's not just related to health, that we also know that studies have shown that college degrees do not protect black women from maternal death. And this is really to illustrate that maternal deaths, <clears throat> excuse me, are higher for black mothers with college educations than white mothers with less than a high school education. So we really need to start looking at what are the structural and systematic ways uh, women and uh, non-white women are getting disenfranchised for their health. So the model that we use with the Office of Research on Women's Health is really uh, looking at the health of women across the life course that really starts before pregnancy. Uh, we're looking at both gender and sex, and really, uh, I can't help but be a geneticist and looking at the epigenomic modifiers that are actually um, determined, uh, really in, in a big part, driven by social determinants of health. And that is really understanding the women in context through their external factors that are social, psychological, um, in, in terms of their environment, the policies that I talked about earlier. And that we need to put those in context as, as we start to understand how do women's bodies and minds change and mature over their lifespan, not only taking in these uh, external factors, but looking at the biological perspectives and trying to figure out what are the sex influences either at the genomic, molecular, or physiological levels? So I just want to highlight there are a couple times in a woman's life that are beacons. One is pregnancy. And at some level, it's a stress test. So what this diagram shows that a lot in a lot of ways, the social determinants really can magnify issues of depression during um, uh, adolescence the preeclampsia uh, or high blood pressure that can, and that can also be manifested as gestational diabetes. And as you can see, um, it also is contributing to the maternal mortality that I had mentioned before, but it doesn't end just there. We can think about um, issues of type two diabetes, hypertension, as well as cardiovascular disease and depression can actually persist. And it really um, gets triggered by the the experiences of pregnancy. Another really hallmark that we need to pay attention is the general area of midlife of women's health. Because what we're learning is this is actually a better time for the onset of chronic diseases among women. And so uh, this, what this uh, study really illustrates is that there is a difference between premenopausal and postmenopausal women, for example, in terms of their cardiovascular disease risk. So this is one of the reasons why we're really trying to emphasize that it's very critical to address the role of menopause in the health of midlife women, because this may be one of the ways we can um, prevent, um, do prevention diagnoses and treatment of not only um, menopause, but also treating other chronic diseases. So to do that, we need to really disentangle what sex and gender mean. They're very different things. So when I think about sex, I'm thinking about the biological factors that are anatomy, physiology, genetics, or hormones. But when we think about gender, it's more of those social determinants, environmental factors that influence the way that, that women think about who they are as women, the roles and norms that they're raised and live with or people expect from them their relationships, and within systems, how much power do they really have about their self-agency? And so what we try to do in our office is really to distinguish them, but make sure that we're inclusive of addressing them together as well. So the other thing I just want to do some level setting is to figure out when I talk about women's health, what am I really talking about? And from our perspective at the office, we actually uh, divide it into three general areas. Um, the first one are conditions that are distinctly female specific. Um, this is the top line that may uh, be endometriosis, cervical cancer, or menopause. We also want to think about uh, conditions that affect men and women, but they disproportionately impact women. These would be like autoimmune disease, osteoarthritis, and chronic pain. 
And then we want to consider the third category of conditions that present and progress differently in women. And this is where we're going to be a hallmark in cardiovascular disease, strokes, and metabolic disorders. Okay, so let's go on this journey, what this actually looks like. So um, endometriosis is a distinctly female condition. It's a chronic disease of the endometrial type tissue that lines the uterus. Uh, we know it affects about 100, 190 million of women in the United States of reproductive uh, age. And we also know it's variable in when it starts and when it ends. It can start as, as early as your first menstrual period and last until all the way through menopause. And the uh, this, the symptoms can actually be variable and at times very severe that include excessive menstrual cramps, abnormal or heavy menstrual flow, and it can really have life impacting pain. Um, and that can actually um, uh, em, uh, sort of radiate through the uh, pelvic pain, abdominal bloating, as well as nausea and fatigue. And what this really is, it really can decrease the quality of life. And it's really to the, the debilitating pain and the psychological sequelae of depression and anxiety that can actually accompany that. And, and I think importantly to remember, it has significant social, public health, and economic implications. Another distinctly female condition is menopause that we've been talking about. And by definition, it is the first 12 months after a woman's last period. And as I'd mentioned before, it really is one of those stress tests. Um, the menopause transition and perimenopause uh, typically are between the ages of 45 and 55. And as you can see from the wheel of the different types of symptoms that affects women differently, ranging from irregular periods to vaginal dryness to sleeping problems mm -hmm. to dermatological issues related to thinning hair and dry skin. Um, but we have to really pay attention that it also leads to brain changes and can significantly impact brain structure and function for those who are into um, uh, uh, the neurosciences. And not only the structure and function, but really the issues of uh, the process and connectivity and metabolic functioning that are really influenced by hormonal um, changes, as well as just the mere phenomenal uh, phenomena of aging of the female brain. So let's think about conditions that disproportionately impact women. I just want to bring one example, and it's neurological and mental disorders. And what you can see in the peach sort of oval uh, highlight is this is where uh, a, a large uh, bolus of uh, people, uh, women are affected that uh, really start from their teenage years all the way uh, up into their 70s. And this is really a uh, up to almost 45 million uh, women, women in the United States. And it's really, um, uh, they're saying that the prevalence is much greater in women as, as well as in youth or adolescents. We also know that uh, what we're also including are general ge uh, anxiety disorders, behavior disorders, mood disorders, oops, and substance use. Okay, here we're continuing the whirlwind. So another uh, example is autoimmune disease. And what we know about autoimmune diseases, it affects about 78% uh, of the U.S. population. And that's about 23 million Americans. And what we know about autoimmune disease is that it has, affects four times more women than men. And it affects all the different uh, systems in our body, ranging from the brain and nervous system with multiple sclerosis, we can go looking at the heart from cardiomyopathy or other uh, autoimmune my, uh, my, myocarditis. We can think of gastrointestinal autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease or celiac spree. Or we can look at our joints with rheumatoid arthritis or uh, blood conditions like hemolytic an anemia. So as you can see with autoimmune diseases, it really spans um, and across the entire um, systems in our body, and it really is affecting a large number of women. The the one of the th things that I wanted to bring to your attention that um, there are conditions that present and progress differently in women, and one of these is intimate partner violence and the sequelae of the survivor health and well being. Um, so for women who are have experienced intimate partner violence, they have increases incidences and um, experiences of depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. 
They can have eating disorders or sleep disturbances. And importantly, we need to really look at issues of chronic pain or hypertension, as well as the increased um, risk for suicide, sexually transmitted infections, and diabetes. So, um, so when now we think about uh, at-risk women, not only do we have to think about diseases, but really their circumstances as well. And we can't forget about cardiovascular disease, which is the number one um, uh, uh, killer of women. We know that women uh, with myocardial infarction receive less guideline-based diagnoses. And what that basically means, our treatment is based not on data. And then when they do have a, a heart attack, they, they in general uh, receive less invasive treatment. Uh, we know they, that treatment can include uh, receiving less anticoagulation with warfarin. And because of that, they have a, a greater uh, risk of stroke. We also know when the EMTs or the uh, emergency technicians come for women who have a, a cardiac incidence, they tend to it's less not. likely receive C, uh, CPR. Okay. So what and this is just demonstrating is that there are a lot of gaps, not only in in um the the treatment of women around health conditions, but really the knowledge and the generated about um. Uh, women's health. We know that about 20% of women report mistreatment receiving maternity care. We know that 80% of people living with autoimmune diseases are women. And that we have to think about global globally, we think about cancer it's rates. Like number, it's the top three cause of prematurity, mortality among, among women. So what we need to really look at are the gaps in the risk factors for women, the diagnostic criteria, when they're diagnosed, what are their treatments? And what are their outcomes since a, there, we have such a large number of deaths per year? And part of it really comes down to the bias uh, against women. And we have to think about the default human and mouse, which tend to be male models. Uh, and using this uh, assumed model, there's an assumed there is an assumption about the fundamental biology that is shared molecularly, biochemically, or physiologically, and that um, there's an assumption that men and women are the same. Um, there's also, a, a, there could be social or cultural factors that include protectionism or paternalism, or a lot of times, you know, we hear that uh, people say, you know, the women's menstrual cycle really complicates um, uh, research, so we're only going to study men. And because of that, there's a preponderance use of males in clinical, um, uh, preclinical and clinical research. And what that ends up doing, it makes all of the research data very unidimensional. And it makes it really hard to understand what truly applies to women. And so this really creates that gap I had mentioned before, because we really have too little research on diseases and conditions of women that have led to these really quite tremendous evidence gaps. So one of the ways our office is trying to address this, and this is really just to show you that we're very active in terms of trying to figure out what are the gaps and what are the strengths in women's health research, and that we try to move it forward here at not only at the National Institutes of Health, but globally. So we can look from the left, looking at um, developing strategic plans that I'll go into a minute, that guide sort of our vision and what um, letting people know what are we are prioritizing. We partner with, with a lot of different groups, not only including the National Academies, uh, the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, but also we, we actually collaborate across the U.S. government. And I'll be talking a little bit later about the, the White House Research uh, Women's Health Initiative. That is one of the ways that we're actively doing that. So let's let's back up a little bit, and I just want to give you context to the the work that we're doing here at the National Institutes of Health is really guided by the NIH wide strategic plan um, that is from 21 to 25. And I just want to bring your attention to the bottom um, that actually women's health is one of the cross cutting themes. This becomes really important because it says that the National Institutes of Health thinks women's health is important and that we need to focus and, and devote um, um, 
resources to really addressing women's health issues. We just released our own, the NIH-wide strategic plan for research on the health of women. And it really is exploding that one area of women's health. And I just wanna to bring to your attention is that there are, are five different areas in general, the research and training and education. But within that, really focusing on data science and management. So I think that really fits in many of your areas. Um, and applying it in basic and translational sciences and really using um, community engaged uh, methods to ensure that we're really meeting the needs of the um, individuals and communities. And, and um, one of the ways that we're doing that in are the six uh, different areas of uh, in our work, looking at interdisciplinary collaborations, looking at preventative care and services, making sure that we're including women and girls in clinical studies, looking at sex and gender differences, um, and really one of the ways we're doing that, and I suspect many of you are doing it, is through uh, ways of using precision medicine to really address the issues of comorbidity and multi um, multimorbidities that we talked about earlier. So this is what we do. This, if you were to compare both of them together, we look at the NIH vision that says their sex and gender should be integrated in all biomedical research, that every woman should receive evidence-based care, and that it's important to nurture and support women in science careers to reach their full potential. And so we actually do that in the Office of Research on Women's Health by enhancing and expanding women's health research, by ensuring that we're including women and minority groups in, in that research, and as well as promoting career advancement for women in their careers. So what are the, how do we do that? We actually um, uh, coordinate, we, in the, in the center, we actually do, oops, well, that was quick. Um, we do it through outreach partnerships and innovations to drive um, pr research priorities. And we do that by priority setting, working and doing workshops and meetings, doing funding opportunities. And it really is trying to not only uh, fulfill our visions, but also really meeting the health needs of all women. So I just want to bring this to your attention. In our office, we have five sig signature programs. And I'm just gonna highlight a few. Um, they, we all have acronyms. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a few of them. One is the Building Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health, and it's a Mentored Career Development Award. We have the Specialized Centers of Research Excellence of Sex Differences, um, as well as uh, funding um, a program for understudied, underrepresented, and underreported uh, women's conditions. And the last two are different funding mechanisms that are really trying to understand the intersection of sex and gender, um, as well as understanding chronic conditions and understudy conditions among women. Let's do a little bit of a deeper dive. So this is the birch, um, and this is really the, the career development. Um, it's very successful. We've actually, it's been around since 2000, um, and they've actually trained over 750 junior faculty. And it's been successful in terms of um, uh, uh, over a third of them have achieved tenure with half of them attaining leadership positions, either as a full professor, associate provost, or deans. And, um, and that in fact, uh, with our coordination efforts with the different institutes and centers at NIH, that we have, have now been able to coordinate and contribute over $10 million to this effort. So it's really been a wonderful success. Another program I want to bring to your attention is what we call the U3, or Underrepresented, Understudied, and Underreported Interdisciplinary Program. And what we're doing here is we're increasing research and collaborations for, um, for the basically underrepresented women, and really paying particular attention to how structural and social determinants of health influence their outcomes. This is our, our recent data book that was just published uh, a few months ago that really hi highlights different conditions that are affecting different women. Just wanna to bring to your attention, because we do know that autoimmune diseases really predominantly affect women, that we have really um, stood up a uh, an office within our office focusing on autoimmune disease research. 
And what we're doing in this office is coordinating a strategic research plan to focus on that diaspora of autoimmune diseases to identify research opportunities and ways we can actually prom, um, really for innovative uh, ways of thinking about autoimmune disease diagnosis, treatment, uh, and treatment. And, um, and as well as really trying to not only support the research, but really um, get that data into a repository to ensure that we could have longevity of the data that all of you are really generating for secondary research use. So basically what we're doing is we're trying to incorporate sex and gender across the entire research continuum, whether it's preclinical, translational or of uh, the clinical trials. Um, it could be cells or animal studies, um, and, and we're, we're looking at sex-specific results reporting and analysis. And we're also seeing what are the implications and how can we actually translate that into healthcare policies, healthcare, as well as careers and education, uh, educational opportunities. So I just want to bring this to your attention. This is that sex as a biological variable policy. It's actually been in effect since 2016. And how did we get here? We really were able, we acknowledged that there was an over-reliance of male animals and cells in research, and there really wasn't enough attention to sex effects. And so what we just, uh, and so what it ended up with, as I had mentioned before, is incomplete knowledge bases. There was a lot of erroneous information and data, and it, at some basic level, it could erode um, um, public trust. So what this policy basically is, expects is sex as a biological variable should be factored into, into all research, whether it's in the designs of the analysis and reporting in animal and human studies. So this is what um, it looks like, because if we do this, it's going to improve uh, the research, um, the clinical research and trial designs. It's going to inform diagnosis and treatment um, by in making um, sex and gender awareness, and it will inform that. It will enable individualized approaches for uh, women and men in what we're calling personalized medicine. And I think importantly, it, it's going to fundamentally foster system-based understanding of what sex and gender really mean on health and disease. So this is that one of those hallmark programs. It's the SCORE, or the Specialized Centers of Research Excellence on Sex Differences. And this uh, is a, a, a group of centers that focus on um, really looking at sex as a biological variable, really examining sex stratified randomization and sex dependent effects in their research. Um, they, um, they're really leveraging adoption of the, of the um, policy. And, and they do that by highlighting opportunities um, through the, um, the policy. They are actively integrating sex and gender in all aspects of research projects. And um, they really to practice that it is an essential step towards individualized medicine. What it's also in, has done is what we're calling the SEGUR guidelines, that is looking at sex and gender equity in research, and where we know that there are um, journals now that are really trying to get authors to, to include sex and gender carefully and um, in their writing of their manuscripts, and where there are social cultural circumstances or gender or biological issues, um, they are wanting um, the manuscripts that they're going to be uh, considering to be putting it in, into their examination of the research. And importantly, that the research should be designed and conducted that should um, at least examine whether sex-related differences exist. So this is um, uh, actively going on. We know that the International Committee on Medical Journal Editors has adopted and encouraged using the Sager Dog guidelines for their suite of journals. We know that recently the World Health Organization is really saying we need to start adopting the Sager um, guidelines as well. Uh, we also know that Nature is also raising, excuse me, raising the bar on sex and gender by having that expectation of also the Sager guidelines. Um, and we know that the um, BMJ is also adopting the Sager guidelines. So what we need to think about is that we the time is moving and that there is a greater adoption. However, it's just not enough. 
and I want to shift a little bit in, in terms of what is not enough, we have to think about the women who are devoting their careers to research. And the way we like to think about a, a career is like a braided river, that people take a lot of different paths in life and that we have to really account those different um, streams of the river for women because they have addition, uh, many of them have additional circumstances related to ruining their families. Many of them are serving in the military or a volunteer course. And many of them have fulfilling, they are fulfilling caregiving responsibilities. And that makes them having to pause or do different paces in their career. So what we need to do is we need to support all women in all stages of their career in terms of, of what this braided river is really trying to illustrate. Because what we know, if we think about women in academic medicine, um, and this is really using um, academic medicine as an example, but I think that if we're looking at um, universities, it's really not that much different. Where there's a large, over half of the, of the medical school applicants are women that uh, a little le just a little bit less may graduate. But by the time they get into faculty positions, it's already gone down 20%. Then if you think about all of them who've gone down and have really made it to full professors, we've already um, decreased it by 50%. And if we get into the, the um, uh, senior management uh, in terms of department chairs or deans, we're down to 18%. So what we need to really pay attention, how come? Why is this happening to women? We know in the United States, if we actually break this down, not only by, by uh, sex, um, but we also go by race. Um, what this illustrates is, is the purple that most of the faculty members are still held by white women, with the next largest is, is Asian women, and, and, uh, and then uh, third is Black or African American women, with Hispanic, Native Hawaiian, and uh, the Pacific Islanders and other uh, groups really rounding it out. So there really is not equity yet in terms of faculty positions. So what we're trying to do is it really that the braided river is, is and what part of the braided river is really contributing to this disparity. This disparity also is shown in, in nature was really, um, they uh, did an examination of publications that they were um, manuscripts and publications, and they really determined that there were too few women being published in nature. And they were gonna try to really do an, a concerted effort uh, in terms of trying to figure out how come and trying to turn that around. So uh, I would like to posit to you that it's more than, it's more than a pipeline uh, issue um, because we do know that a lot of women begin their scientific and medical careers, but they really don't achieve that equal status in leadership. It's really not because women are less capable or qualified. It really is this uh, system, the systematic issue. And that's what we're talking about, the structure of where they work or the, the rules that are made to how you get in and how you get promoted. So um, we really need to pay attention to the, a much more holistic way of doing that. Okay. And so what we have to think about is uh, a big part of this is care uh, caregiving impacts employment. And that what we know is that for women scientists, um, they tend to have a, a at least a 5% larger decline in research time than their male counterparts. I, I've seen recent studies that it actually is a lot more. And we know that women um, who are mothers with at least one child under five, that can go um, up to almost 20% with less time to do the actual research. And this is really based on a study where they, they um, really equalize the, the different professions. So this is really to show that, you know, caregiving can really impact the, the progression of a woman's career. So, so I just want to just highlight that uh, the Office of Research on Women's Health has, a, a, has uh, many programs related to supporting women across these different life experiences. And I would encourage you to go onto our website and you can see those uh, ex, uh, different opportunities. Or of course, you can always um, reach out to me and I'll be happy to talk you through them. 
So basically what we need to do is we need to connect the dots across this research continuum, not, not only from the basic um, sciences to the preclinical, but really having it translate into clinical practices as a way of optimizing health for everyone at every age in every stage. And so one of the ways what we're doing this is we are really working with the White House who launched the White House Initiative on Women's Health Research last November. It's very exciting because what they're doing is that they are prioritizing women's health across the lifespan um, to really across the federal government to say, can we make a difference? And I can say, yes, we can. Um, and, and from that initial announcement that in the March 18th, there was an executive order 14120 on advancing women's health research and innovation. And this is really the roadmap that uh, I'm going to talk to you about, where our office is, is actually quite pivotal. The director, uh, Dr. Janine Clayton, is not only um, co-chairing one of the cross um, department and agency groups, um, but we're also coordinating all the activities for the National Institutes of Health. It's a it's a pretty large collaboration, as you can see. It's across eleven federal departments and agencies that range from the Department of Federal um, Veterans Affairs to the Office of Management and Budget to Defense to FDA to actually the U.S. Department of Agriculture, as well as Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to advance and be true to the um, directive of interdisciplinary transformative research for women's health. So this is what it is in a snapshot. Um, it is a comprehensive uh, set of executive orders that we are, are uh, trying to fulfill, falling into four categories, um, starting in the um, uh, upper left-hand corner is really um, really trying to look at research and data standards on women's health that I think applies to many of you on the on the um, call and really looking at ways we can develop and strengthen that. Going to the right on a cl uh, clockwise is we want to see how we can prioritize grants and other awards to advance uh, research on women's health. And one of the ways we're going to do that is trying to find and develop a common language so people actually will be able to have that common um, shared understanding of what women's health is. And then going to the next one is this, what we talked about earlier, is to do a systematic way of understanding and addressing the research gaps, because we need to be able to have to, the data generated to actually uh, inform that clinical care. And then the last quadrant, but not least, is really identifying that policy or statutory piece um, and to see if are there changes that we need to do to ensure that the federal laws and policies will truly support women's health research more effectively. This makes it look much more simple than it is, by the way. It's, it's just really corralling a lot of those players and getting us all moving in the same direction. So I just want to tell you, we've been very busy since last November, and I want to show you some of the things that we've already done. Um, we're calling this, it's new, it's called the front door, and this is a, 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 a central place where researchers can find all women's health funding opportunities at the National in Institutes of Health. You're going to get a copy of the presentation, so you're going to get all of the links. Um, and what this is, is on a rolling basis, it will list all of the opportunity, uh, funding opportunities that available for women's health, not only the ones that the Office of Research of Women's Health um, uh, supports, but all of them at the National Institutes of Health. So right now we know that it's, um, there's about 45 notices of funding opportunities and um, and right now, um, there, I think there are overall, there are about 200 opportun uh, funding opportunities. So please, I encourage you to look at this rather than going through each of the different institutes. This is the one front door you can go through. This is uh, really new and exciting. And this is one of the things we did to expand the funding pathways for women's health. So even though I told you about those individual funding opportunities, we actually, it, it's like a rider. And so what we did is that we had a notice of special interest that says all parent grants, all funding opportunities at NIH really now have to accept research applications related to women's health. 
based on the definition I, I talked to you earlier about that are conditions that predominantly affect women, present and progress differently in women, and are female specific. So this uh, came into being in, in May and it's gonna go for two years. So what this basically means that every grant opportunity or funding opportunity now has a writer for women's health. So what this means is now that uh, we have over 175 priority topics identified by the notice across all of NIH, all of the institute, we have, you know, there's 27, um, uh, institutes, and we have 30 participating institute centers and offices. So I think this is a, one of the real game changers for our women's health research. We didn't leave the uh, small business and innovation people. So we did the equivalent, which um, is technically called the SBIR, STTR Omnibus. So there's also now a women's health writer on this as well. For those of you who are trying to do the translation of your basic research into small businesses and innovation. So we've tried to make as many opportunities available to all of you to really forward your work and for the work around uh, research in women's health. We have to um, also acknowledge that every two years we do a report uh, from the uh, to the advisory committee on research on women's health. And this is really um, uh, wanted to bring to your attention that we have new cross-cutting integrative topics where you can learn what each of the institutes are doing in the six areas of aging, autoimmune disease, mental health and substance use, maternal mortality and mortil um, morbidity, as well as the, as the social determinants of health and violence. What we also uh, recently did, and this is aligned with the department, is we have fact sheets that you can actually give for those of your clinicians or actually for researchers. And these are state of the um, science uh, fact sheets from women's health on um, five different areas, as you can see. A lot of them I've mentioned before, um, but just wanted to also add that the ones I haven't mentioned previously as much is dementia and HIV. So these are also resources that are now available um, to all researchers uh, who are interested in women's health. And then of course, we have a, a suite of e-learning e courses related to sex and gender, and many of them have free uh, continuing medical education credits. So I, I would encourage you to actually look at these as well. And then lastly, we have a lot of different ways you can connect with us. We have a monthly email that we send out um, uh, latest findings in women's health research. We have a quarterly magazine of In Focus that is focusing on different aspects of women's health. But the last one that was just published was really looking at issues of women and, and mental health um, across their lifespan. And what I just previously mentioned is we have ways to really um, do continuing education to keep people up to date on issues around research and women's health. And I just wanna leave with, with you some parting words. I think it's important that we really have to address equity. And I, I really believe that if not designed to address equity, research will perpetuate disparities and injustices. And all of us have a responsibility to make a difference by putting it into our research in the way we think. And that's all I have for you. Thank you, Dr. Otawang. Uh, this is a really great talk and inspiring. Um, so I, I'd like to open the floor to for questions. I, I'm sure there are lots of questions, especially from the Korean side, because uh, they've been really curious about the, especially the um, research, women's uh, re health related research within the NIH and also the um, initiative uh, from the White House. Anyone? You may have to agree with the ones that are in Korean. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Please just um, turn on your mic and ask the question. Um, oh, if anyone, just, um, yeah, okay, yeah, Dr. Lee. Well, yeah, just leave the uh, audience to prepare the question. I would like to uh, ask one question. Uh, I mean, it's very inspiring, very thoughtful. I'm really deeply impressed uh, of the full version of women's health in 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 US. Uh, 
I have actually I have two questions. One is, uh, the the uh, the President Biden's uh, Biden's uh, executive order will be continued after his presidency, uh, in the next uh, present. And the other question is, I really do hope. And another question is, uh, many data, health data, and knowledge is gender bias already. But that's transmitted to the um, health uh, artificial intelligence. Is yeah. there any way of um, some policies or research going on in U.S. to prevent or to reduce the uh, gender bias in AI health? Health AI. Um, Thank you. Okay, let me. I'll do the first question first. Um, so you know we have this White House initiative on women's health. And I, I think the way that we're thinking about it, this office has been around for 35 years and this and the, we're doing it. We've, we've been doing the work. So the work is just going to continue. So I think the, the executive order was an opportunity to highlight the importance of women's health and potentially put in um, additional ways of thinking about it. But uh, in, the, in terms of women's health, it's not going away that in fact, uh, we're gonna persist. So um, whatever um, is going to happen um, uh, in the fall, uh, what, what I've talked about is going to continue. And that, um, yeah, we're, gonna, we're not gonna disappear because we're fighters at heart and we know that this is important. So I wanna reassure you that we're con gonna continue to move forward and I'm just gonna expect that you're all gonna be by my side. So I know where to find you now. The, the other uh, question you have, I think, is really important. So I was used to be in the Office of Data Science Strategy at the NIH and was focusing on data bias related to artificial intelligence and ethics. And I think it is a fundamental problem that has not been really addressed very satisfactorily. Because you're right, you know, people are using data sets that have that um, built in bias. And so when the artificial intelligence, when the people are using those algorithms, they are perpetuating and accentuating those biases. So there are some, and part of that, the Women's Health Initiative, and I, I will say that work in our office is also working on, on this issue as well, is that we need to figure out, it's, it's multifold, right? One is where is the bias occurring and where is it being sort of created? I know that people are looking at the algorithms themselves, but sometimes maybe we need to look at the people who are building the algorithms to see if they're putting their own biases into it. And I know that there are, are pockets of people in data science that are trying to figure out, can we do ways of looking at once the artificial intelligence is generated enough of information, can we build in safeguards to say, well, what you've generated is generating a bias? So I know there's a large uh, body of work on that. But I, I think to your point of there's so much biased data that in fact, what we still need to do is we still need to collect data. And so we need to do it in ways that um, tries to address those built in sort of societal or systemic biases and then run that artificial intelligence. So in data speak, you know, what we're talking about, it depends on, on, the, on, the, on the data set that you are training your artificial intelligence on. And so I think part of, uh, of the piece is that we can't wait for all this data to be collected. But I, I do think that there are some training sets that may be out there that may be useful as, as ways to sort of build those uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. So I'm, what I'm saying sounds easy and I know it's not. But I think unless we start naming it what it is and trying to do things to identify the bias, I think there are, are concerns that the bias against women is going to get accentuated as more people use artificial intelligence. But I think part of it is naming it and sort of say, this is what we need to do for those safeguards. Because I think for many people, they're just thinking it's really cool and exciting and they're not really realizing there's another side to that coin. Do you have any other thoughts to that? It, it's a great question. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but it's a long, uh, uh, I mean, we have to 
discuss. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a sort of future problem. It's, it's immediate, but also very um, uh, need an extensive and long discussion on this topic, I suppose. You know, and the other piece is, is to even make it more complicated that not all women and lived experience are the same either. I mean, the mere fact that we're on a call with with women who live in the United States versus Korea really demonstrates some variability. And so then we have to figure out how do we take the, the valued um, lived experiences that are very different how do we deal with the artificial intelligence? How do we deal with it with uh, research designs? Um, but I think we need to to go. We actually have to move forward by addressing it and doing something, and then modifying as we go ahead. Thank you. Um, we're at the top of the hour. I am very sorry to uh, have to end the session today. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, please, is it okay to email you, Dr. Otomo? Absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah. if, please use me as a resource, and you'll have um, the slides available so you get all those websites. But if mm -hmm. other questions come up, um, please um, feel free to reach out to me. That's great. Yeah. And then as, as a, a principal investigator working the autoimmunity field within the National Institute of Aging. I am very, very grateful uh, for what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I appreciate okay. you being down in the trenches. You know, it's, <laughs> it was a former life of mine. I appreciate it. Okay. So um, before we close, I would like to give the mic to Dr. Kim for the closing remarks. Yeah, uh, thank you. And thank you all for joining us today for this informative and engaging webinar. We would like to extend our deepest appreciation to our speaker, Dr. Vivian Ora Wang, for sharing our expertise and valuable insight with us. Your contributions have certainly enriched our understanding of why sex and gender matter in women's health research. I also want to thank everybody in the audience for your active participation and thoughtful questions, which made this session more interactive and dynamic. And please stay tuned for our upcoming fifth webinar next month. Once again, a big thank to you, Dr. Ot uh, Vivian Otawa Wang and all of you for being here today. And we look forward to seeing you in future events. And have a great day to folks in South Korea and good night to folks <laughs> in US. <laughs> good day and good night. Thank you. Dr. Song, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, a, a announcement for the next webinar is um, October 30th on Wednesday, um, the Eastern uh, time, and October 31st on Thursday uh, from Korean time. And Dr. Professor Park, Jong Chen, and Dr. Hong Ho Kyung will be uh, presenting. So thank you all for attending. Uh, is, is Dr. Otawa still here? Or did she leave already? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>